past seven o'clock tonight. I'm glad you're here. On a warm day. We'll get by it. We'll get through it. We're going to continue tonight talking about prayer. We'll be there in just a moment. We'll have a prayer to get started. Mike Rendolph, would you lead some prayer? I said turn to the Lord's Prayer in the Bible. Where would you turn? John. Chapter 17. 17. That's right. I didn't say the model prayer, the Lord's model prayer, but the Lord's Prayer. Because in John 17, we have the Lord praying. Now the model prayer is when he's teaching his disciples about prayer. But here in John 17 is where he, had, where he goes to God in prayer. He makes several requests in this prayer. We're going to look at those requests that he makes, that he made, and, and he says a lot of things, and it all has meaning to it. But it's John 17 and verse 1, 1 through 3 first. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So it's getting pretty close to the time of Christ's death. He knows the hours at hand. And here, one of the last things he does on the earth is that he prays, and he prays for several things that he does this. But he starts out in this prayer asking God for the glory to be given to God. That through what he is about to go through, that he'll be glorified, and because of what he's going through, that God will be glorified. And that's what Christ is asking for right here. He wants the world to know that he is the son of God. He wants to, his death to show that. He wants the world to know that, that God made all this possible from the very beginning, before any time ever began, that God had this in his plan of how he's going to save mankind. So in doing so, he's going to show that God keeps his promises. He's going to show that there's no greater love for man than what Christ is about to do right here. And hopefully after it's all over, the world will thank God for what he has done and thank Christ for what he, is, what he has done. And that's what he's wanting to do. The word glorify means to, to magnify, to enlarge. And when Christ goes through this, it's hopefully it's going to open the eyes of the people to what he has done. I mean, they're going to really stop and we'll take his sin. What he went through, from the standpoint that he was, the, uh, of course, the Messiah. And then at his death, when the veil in the temple ripped, and that was no little ordinary veil, that was about 40 foot wide, around uh, 30 foot tall, around six inches thick, this cloth. Had to be something incredible ripped from the top down that would get their attention. And then when the earth quaked, and when the darkness set in that day at from 12 to 3, it would cause people to take notice that this is something different. Something's going on here. 
You just don't have this happening every day. And of course, the greatest of all, three days later, at the resurrection, then they would certainly know that he was the Son of God. And Christ gave as a sign. He, says, I, he said, I'm going to give you one sign that I'm the Son of God. It was the sign of what? Jonah, the sign of Jonah. Being in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, he says, when you see this happen, you will know without a doubt that I am the Messiah. And certainly after three days and three nights, he came out of the tomb, and therefore we know there's his proof. The only sign I'm going to give. Now he had he did many miracles and great teachings, and, and that certainly showed that he was a, a somebody from God. God sent him. But was he the Messiah? Well, that was going to be coming directly through, through that of the resurrection. And in verse 3 there, and this is eternal life that they may know you. Again, that's more than just knowing facts. We know a lot of facts about God or about Christ. We know facts. But how many, how many of us really know him? Really know what he's about? Know about his compassion, his love, and his his care and all that. That's what he's speaking about here. That they may know you, the one true God and Christ. So all this hopefully is going to show mankind just how much God and Christ care about the creation, care about mankind, that we can know that. So his death, Christ is praying here about his death, that will bring God the glory in what he did. Verse 4 and 5. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Again, talking about glorifying God. Christ says, I have glorified you. I've done everything you told me to do. Perfection. He says, I have finished the work. Well, he hasn't really finished the work. He's still got one more thing to do, the work of death. He's got to go through that. But there's no problem with that. He's not contradicting himself. It's just a term that we use sometimes. You remember back in school when you had a paper to do, and that paper was due, we'll say, Monday morning at 8 o'clock at school. Well, you finished, hopefully you finished that paper sometime Sunday night, and you look back and you say, well, it's finished. Well, yeah, you finished your part, but you still got to turn it in. You got one more part to play. And what Christ is saying here, it's as good as finished. One more step to take, and the plan of God will be fulfilled, the work he gave me to do. And he certainly did that. And that's why he said on the cross, some of the final words, phrases he used, it is finished. He certainly completed it on the cross. So one last thing he's got to do here, and it will be completely finished, but it is finished, good as finished. And, uh, and what he prays for here in these five verses to, to glorify God, you know, that'd be a good prayer for us as well. Hopefully we try to live a life that will glorify God also. People can look at us, they can see God, they can see Christ in us, and that's what we do. We try to live that kind of life, and therefore we give God the credit. We glorify Him through our words, through our actions. They see, they look at us and see a reflection of Christ, glorify Him. So again, that's what He asked for in His death to be glorified. Hopefully we can do the same thing. We should at least do our best to try to do so. So the first five verses in this prayer is about giving God the glory. Make sure God gets the glory for all that's going to be taking place. Just like the glory that was with us before the world was. There was glory there. In verse 6, we have another request. 6 through 10. I have manifested your name to the man whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. 
They have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have give, given me are from you. For I have given them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. So here he's praying for the twelve disciples, or later apostles as they will be, praying for them. He's thanking God that you have given me these twelve good men, that you've given to me to, to take this work on after I'm gone. Praying for that. Now he, he prays about these things. And he says, I've given them my, your word. But yet, it was a growing process for them. And sometimes they wavered. But yet, it was always a process that as they were growing, they were trying to learn more and more about the Lord, learn more about why he was here. And there were still things, even on that Friday, that they did not understand. And things on that day that he ascended back to heaven that they did not understand. But they would. But it, would, it was going to take some time for this, for this to take place. But every day, they were growing in the things that he was talking about. And, uh, and that gave Christ here to pray for them. Pray that they would continue to grow without any doubts. Strengthen them. And after they see the resurrection, after they witness that, and they see him ascend into heaven, there is no way that these men would want to falter. There was no way that these, these 12 men, or, well, after Matthew came in, there's no way that they were going to fall from this after seeing these things. And there we see Christ and his prayer being answered as these men continue the rest of their lives. Uh, they were martyred in so many different ways, and tortured and such, but yet they never, never denied the Lord. That's how strong they were in this. So he proved himself time and time again to them, and as he did this, they grew stronger every day, especially at the resurrection, seeing him. Now, Nathaniel was one of the one, the first ones that Christ chose. And it, it didn't take a lot of being around Christ long for Nathaniel to know, hey, you're the son of God. In John 1, 47 and 49, this is where Christ comes upon Nathaniel. And Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. The first time they meet, and Christ tells him something about what you were doing earlier. Nathaniel's convinced, this is him. This is him. And that just that quick it took place. Just that quick, Nathaniel knew. This man was different. Now, as the years went on, of course, Nathaniel grew in his belief that he had, and that's a good thing. But Nathaniel knew something. Nobody would know this unless he was the son of God. In verse 50 and 51, they continue, and Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You think this is something, Nathaniel? That I can tell you what you were doing, you know, an hour ago under a fig tree? You just wait. And you're going to see a lot greater signs than these. You're going to see some mighty powers that's going to be sent down upon Christ, things that he can do. So again, he is going to show you some things that, that's really going to 
cause you to think, really going to concrete this belief that, you're, that I am the Son of God. Another time in Mark 4, Christ stilled a storm here, and that got their attention. 439, then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? So when he said a few words here, three words, and everything just came to a calm, they knew this man is different. Something about this man. So even though Nathaniel knew Christ, Son of God, he's in this boat right here, he got scared. But the, the fear helped him when he saw what Christ could do. So Christ prayed for his apostles. He prayed for them that their faith would grow. And it certainly did. And then in verse 11, John 17, 11, he prayed something else for his apostles. Now, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. So he prays for their unity. He does want these 12 men to divide up and one go this direction or that direction, teaching or preaching a different thing, and they didn't do it. Nowhere do you find for these 12 men began to start their own movement. It didn't happen. They were one. They, they were taught as one. And they had the same mission to go into all the world, you know, teach the gospel to every creature. That's what they did. It wasn't until after, you know, the apostles that all this division came into play. And people started dividing over that. As early as in Corinth, there in 1 Corinthians 1, where they began to try to divide themselves up into four different groups. And Paul said, you know, that's not to be, not, not to be that way. But every once in a while, these disciples here, they got the big head. Christ had to bring them back down to earth. They wanted to know who's going to be the one in charge after you leave. And can I be at your right hand, other left hand? They want to know all these things. And Christ put them in their place. Quickly taught them three times here that no division. You're going to be, you're going to hopefully stay together, and that's what he's praying for. That prayer will still be applied to us as well. No division. Don't divide up what he's praying for. Now, verse 12. John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Well, he kept them, but there was one. We know it was Judas. Uh, he departed. The devil got a hold of him. He began to think only about today. He didn't think about the future, anything of that matter. He, has, he was focused on those 30 pieces of silver. And uh, he, he, he was lost. Acts 1 speaks of him going to his own place. He was lost. So of the 12, of the original 12, there's one that, that sort of went to the side, wayside. He lost his focus. Lost his focus on what it was important. Now, verse 15 and 16. Still praying for the disciples. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. He prays for their protection from Satan. Because you know Satan's going to be after him. And he was after, after them. 
and uh, maybe not in, in particular one on one, but he certainly was working through others, doing his best to get to them and to stop them. He, he, he had success at that, as far as the persecution that they went through. But he's praying that, for their protection. Do you ever pray for your protection from Satan? He's out there. He's alive and well. You ever pray for your protection? Lord, help me. Don't let him get a hold of me. Keep me you know, strong enough to, when I see that temptation, that I can stay away from it, ward it off. We need God's help in this. We, we can't do it. Would you want to go one on one with him? One on one with Satan? He probably wouldn't make it very long. He'd, he'd get the best of us. And that's why we got to have him. Uh, we want God in our life, Christ in our life, and pray for our protection. Keep those temptations away. And when they come, help me to overcome those and not fall for them. You know, we talked about Judas. Luke talks about him as well. Luke 22, verse 3. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. He couldn't have entered him unless, unless Judas opened the door. And then John 13, 2. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Put it, he put it before him. And he took the bait. And he goes and betrays Christ. So Christ prayed for his protection of, the, of these men. We should be praying for protection ourselves and for others. Now verse 17, John 17, 17. Another part of, of the disciples. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. You have sent me into the world. I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself. That they also might be sanctified by the truth. Sanctify means to set apart for holy use. I'm going to put this aside for holiness. That's where sanctification is. Well, he wants them to be put aside by truth. That's what he wants them to be grounded in. Their word. Your word is truth. And today there's so much emotion in religion or Christianity. Emotions. People want to be led by their emotion and not truth. They want to let their heart guide them and not truth. And that gets a person in trouble. Because if it's the heart that's doing the guiding, you don't need truth. If my heart contradicts truth, I'm going to go with my heart. That's what, what's going to happen. And we do need emotions. Emotions are part of, of being a Christian. It's part of our Christian service. But the, but the truth is the engine, and emotions are the caboose. You get the truth down, and then as you learn it, you apply it, and your, your emotions go, get into it, and you love doing what you do. So uh, he's praying here for them to be sanctified, set apart for the truth. And then in verse 20 through 23, here he's praying for us. He's praying for us right now. Are you praying for anybody 2,000 years in the future? Who would you be praying for? Well, here Christ is, verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, that would be the disciples, apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, you and me, they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. 
So he's praying for us that we'll be united, but Christianity has failed in this prayer. There is certainly no unity in Christianity. There's so many differences. Imagine what influence Christianity would have on the world if everybody was one teaching the same thing. What difference that would make. But being divided, the skeptics and the atheists, that's just kindling to them, all this division. You're using the same Bible, and yet you say you're using the same Bible, and, and you, you, got, you do this, and you do this. Again, uh, God didn't want that. Christ didn't want that. But uh, he prayed for it. He prayed for unity. And certainly, we, we may not have it as far as Christianity goes as a whole, but, but we can have it here. We certainly can have unity here. A whole lot we can do about the world of division in the world, but we, we can't let it happen here. Then in verse 24 through 26, again, he goes back to his apostles. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. Now I declare to them your name, and will declare it that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I am and I am them. He's praying here, he wants his disciples to be with him one day in heaven. That's what he wants. Be with me in heaven. That's where he wants them to be. That's where he wants us all to be. One day with him in heaven. That's why he came. So we could be with him in heaven. And in John 14, 1 through 3, he makes it very plain in teaching there. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Christ wants us to be with him in heaven one day. God wants us to be with him in heaven. He's praying about that. Now we pray about it as well. Hope, hope in our prayers, we're praying. We want, to go, we want to be there as well. And we're praying for others. Hopefully, you know, we want them there. And here's the Lord's Prayer. And then Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Look it unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne. It says here, the joy that was set before him. There wasn't any joy in suffering the way he suffered. But there was joy in his knowing that in my death, I'm going to be, have a home for them one day where they don't have all this trouble and pain and grief and everything they go through. I'll let it be over. That's what he's, what he's, what he's doing. That's the joy he looked. He looked at the greater good that was going to take place. The greater good of one day that those who are prepared will be with him in heaven. So there is the real Lord's Prayer. The real one. Matthew talks about in other places the model prayer. We looked at it, I think, a bit last week. But here's the Lord's Prayer. The one that he prayed. And we find him other places praying. We find him praying, but this was the we see the extension of it, what he was praying for. Sometimes it says he went up on the mount to pray, or on the olive, Mount of Olives to pray. We don't know what he prayed. But here we know what he prayed. We know what he prayed. Any comment on the, the Lord's Prayer here? All right, next week, remember, we start at 6.30, Vacation Bible School. And uh, we 
have speakers each night for the adult class. So be here at camp 630. There will be somebody. There always is. That gets here a little before 7. Ah, I forgot. You'll say, ah, oh, he told me. <laughs> well, 630 next week, Sunday through Wednesday. Look forward to a good week. It's going to be a busy week. And probably going to be a hot week. Sorry. All right. We'll conclude here.